I have a brilliant idea. Let's do seven 24-hour fasts per week. It's a great frequency. It's genius. Okay, but in reality, how frequently should you fast if longevity is your goal, if that's what you're fasting for? Well, look at the chart that's on the screen right now. Okay, this is a general hormetic curve chart. Now, it might scare you because it's a chart, but it's a very basic. Essentially, it shows that fasting is a stressor, and in this particular case, it's looking at stress in general, a hormetic curve. So what happens is a little bit of stress gets you a nice stress response where you get stronger. A moderate amount of stress gets you even stronger, but then you reach a certain point where if you look on the far right of this chart, it becomes toxic, it becomes a problem, where too much stress, whether it's fasting, exercise, or whatever, starts having diminishing results and even detrimental outcomes. So where is the perfect number for longevity? Well, a lot of this video is anecdotal and speculative because there's research, but we have to kind of cross-pollinate the research, if that makes sense. So anyhow, we'll dive into all of it, and hopefully it'll all make sense and give you a solid, I don't know, playbook for you to follow. The first thing that we should do is we should look at exercise as a comparison. Exercise is not the same as fasting, but in a lot of ways it is, so we can look at some of the data from exercise and be able to understand some things and how it translates with fasting. Because as far as a stressor is concerned, remember, the benefit from fasting we're getting in a longevity perspective is from the stress result. The benefit from exercise that we are getting is from the stress, okay? So there is a great study published in the Science of Medicine, and this looked at how frequently people exercise. And they found that people that were extremely active had higher mortality rates than people that were very active. So on the far end of the exercise spectrum, there was actually more increase in mortality. However, those that were doing extreme levels of exercise were still better off than those that were doing minimal amounts of exercise. Now, this is with exercise, but we could probably say similar things with fasting. Someone that is fasting a whole lot, probably still better than someone that never fasts at all in terms of, or, or never gets themselves in a deficit, let's say that, okay? But someone that fasts to the extreme is probably much worse off than someone who moderately fasts. But that's kind of basic, right? We just, okay, well, what defines moderate amounts of fasting? So let's dive in deeper and understand some things. First, we need to understand and recognize when you are fasting too much, okay? First indicator, you're losing muscle, okay? If you are losing muscle, you are flat out fasting too much. And the problem is that a lot of influencers in the fasting community will tell you, well, you're having this 2,000% increase in growth hormone, so you're not gonna burn muscle. That's incorrect. I mean, yes, you have pulses that are high, but if growth hormone was magic, that would mean that I could give you growth hormone and you could never eat and you'd maintain your muscle. That defies all laws of physics and thermodynamics, right? So that's not how it works. Growth hormone certainly does preserve some muscle, but it's not to the extreme that people might think. If you're fasting too much, you're going to have too much autophagy where you have too much of your muscle protein being broken down for fuel. That's just all there is to it. So if you start sacrificing muscle and you are real with yourself and you look in the mirror and you notice that you're wasting away or just losing muscle and losing strength, that is an indicator, okay, I probably need to fast a little less. It's just a clear image indicator. There's a study that was published in Medical Science and Sports and Exercise that painted a great picture of this. If you're losing muscle, you are probably affecting longevity. They found the more amounts of muscle mass that people carried, the lower the risk of mortality. Pretty clean, clear as day. Doesn't really talk about bodybuilders, there's probably other factors coming in there. But the reason is, is muscle is a glucose sink, so it helps you with insulin glucose modulation. It's also going to improve uh, you from being super frail if you take a fall and you break something. And it's also a flat out reserve. Muscle is a reserve. If you get really sick, really, really, really sick, right? If you have some muscle on you, it is a preserving factor. Okay, so when you start fasting so much that you're losing muscle, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and you are reducing the effect of the fast in the first place. The other interesting one is if you are having so much fat loss over the age of 50 or 60 that you're getting down into like single digits. Okay, maybe 9% would be okay, but the thing is is that when you're younger, it's one thing to be in single digit body fat. 
Okay, I'm in my 30s and I am single digit body fat. But the evidence is pretty clear that as you get older, having a little bit of healthy fat on you to be in maybe the low double digits or even mid double digits is fine. And in fact, it's probably advantageous for you to have a little bit of fat on you. The International Journal of Obesity published a paper that looked at this, found that people that were in the third quintile of BMI and overall body fat, actually like even up to like 20-ish percent, actually had more resiliency and lower risk of mortality. Now this is for people that are a little bit older, once again. And it comes right back down to it, right? If you are going to get sick and you have a little bit of fat on you, it acts as a buffer. And we have to take that into consideration. I know it's not always the best thing. I'm not saying go be obese. I'm saying if you start getting yourself super lean, then you don't realize when you're starting to pull from other things. So pay close attention to it. Now, obviously there are ways that you can mitigate this. If you fast more, and we'll talk more about this, you should increase your protein, period. Okay. I think there's too much, uh, garbage out there saying we need to reduce our protein intake. If you're fasting, you're in a little bit of a different category. You need to have some compensatory mechanism with you know, protein synthesis. You need to have muscle protein synthesis for all the breakdown that occurs during a fast. So consume protein, consume higher protein foods. I don't care if they're plant-based. I don't care if it's meat. That's on you. Okay. I put a link down below for Thrive Market. They have a lot of different like protein snacks, different jerkies, different biltongs, things like that. The reason I mentioned Thrive is because they are a place that you can get everything. They're a sponsor on this channel, but there's also a 30% discount link. So you save 30% off your entire grocery order. Even if you stocked up your grocery cart with $500, right? 30% off your entire first grocery order plus a $50 free gift, a gift up to $50. So that link is down below. You go on to Thrive Market, you can sort by different diets. So if you're lower carb or you can sort by higher protein, lower sugar, you can just get the kinds of things that you want and then they get delivered right to your doorstep. So that link is down below. I really recommend for people that are into fasting, I think it's something that people should look at because you don't wanna just be eating the regular foods that you would normally get at the grocery store all the time. When you're fasting, you need to make up some of that protein. You need to be paying attention to what you're putting in your body. And Thrive Market makes it easy and intuitive for that. So that link's down below in the description, 30% off your entire grocery order. Check them out. So what frequency is best? Well, guess what? I have another chart for you, okay? So the chart that's popped up on the screen right now, you can see it has five zones. Zone one, two, three, four, and five. And these are all different rates of, in this particular case, we're gonna say with fasting, right? So. We'll talk about what each zone represents here in just a second. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into zone one. Zone one, you can see on the chart that there's not a lot of uh, height to the chart. The height of the chart, the height of the line indicates your overall benefit. Zone one, in this case, we're gonna say is like a sporadic 24 hour fast. Maybe you're doing one to 24 hour fasts per month. You're still getting a benefit and it's better than no fast at all, absolutely but you're not getting a huge benefit in this zone one. Now, the reason that you're not getting a lot of benefit in this zone one from a longevity perspective is for one, you're not really in ketosis long enough, okay? You should be fasting long enough and frequently enough that your body can get into a ketogenic state during a fast. Whether you like ketosis or not, this is important for the fast because a lot of the cellular benefit we're looking for specifically from a longevity perspective, histone deacetylase inhibition, FOXO3, things like that, they are helped by ketones being present. The other thing, and this is a huge one, is the fasts are so infrequent that you probably are overcompensating for calories in the time you're not fasting. If you do two 24 hour fasts per month, the chance of you overeating on your other days and being at it still a net positive in your calories is pretty high. You wanna find that sweet spot of fasting just enough where you're just kind of sitting at maintenance or slightly in a deficit. So that leads us into zone two. Zone two is a nice place to be in personally. Okay, zone two is maybe where you're doing like four 24 hour fasts per month. Nice number for longevity, not over the top, but it's just enough to start getting some benefits. And that's why you see that line starting to increase and in hockey stick up quite a bit. So in this particular case, you're getting more fat adaptation. You're training the mitochondria to be able to use fats more efficiently and you're kind of getting that flip flop back and forth. You're also going to be in ketosis for a little bit longer period of time, casting a positive benefit there. But I think most importantly, it's a little bit harder to overcompensate for the deficit. Okay, the deficit from the fast is very beneficial. If you're doing four 24 hour fasts per month, that ends up, you know, let's say roughly you consume 3000 calories a day. That means you'd have to overcompensate by 3000 calories to offset that 24 hour fast each week. That's fairly hard. It's easy to do, but also hard to do if you're really watching things. Then we have zone three, which is right where the benefits seem to peak. And this is like six, seven ish, 24 hour fasts per month. 
Okay, so you're doing like maybe one week you do one 24 hour fast and the next week you do two 24 hour fasts. That seems to be where we see nice benefit as far as the hormetic stressor. However, it all depends on the person. This is why so much of this is speculative. If you're also running marathons, maybe that's too much, right? Now, one of the things we need to pay attention here is, okay, if you're doing this, you're getting fat adapted. So when you do get into your fast, you're producing higher ketone levels. You're able to get to that ketone stage better. You have a little bit more of that restorative effect that comes there. So that's something to pay attention to. What's very, very important along with this frequency of fasting is that you are increasing protein, but you are also exercising, specifically resistance training. If you just start increasing your amount of fasting, your fasting frequency, and you do not exercise, you will break down muscle. Okay, you need to use it or you lose it. And that is the price that you pay when you increase your fasting frequency. People think, oh, I don't want to use my muscles because I'm going to burn them up. No, if you don't use them, you lose them. Use your muscles, use them when you fast, please, for love of all things good. Okay, then we move into zone four and you see things are starting to decline. Not to a terrible level, but at this point you have to ask yourself the question, if I'm fasting like 10 plus times per month, is it too much? Now we're not talking about a 16 hour fast here. We're talking about longer fasts that have a you know, longevity effect, 24 hour fast, 10 plus 24 hour fast per month. You're not necessarily doing a lot of damage, but you're not getting as much benefit. Okay, at this point, you're fasting so much that you, maybe you're inflicting so much stress upon your body that's not that beneficial, and you should pay attention to that. And then we move into zone five, where you're fasting a lot. You're fasting like 15 plus 24 hour fasts per month. That's like doing alternate day fasting all month. Fast, don't fast, fast, don't fast. Doing extreme, that's, that's a lot. And at that point and beyond, you start to have increasing levels of literal toxic toxic amounts. Okay, it's toxic amounts. You start having a toxic impact. And at that point, you really need to look in the mirror and wonder if you have a fasting addiction because it is a very, very, very real thing that I have experienced myself. So use caution. How do you measure if your fasting is working though? First thing you want to do, if you are improving your life through fasting, you will see an improvement in your fasting glucose and an improvement in your glucose after eating meals. Plain and simple. If after eating meals, your glucose still spikes and stays high, you are probably not getting a metabolic benefit from fasting that you think you are, okay? Now, when you measure your glucose, do it on days that you're not fasting because on days you're fasting, things are gonna be skewed and out of whack, okay? Because you have peripheral insulin resistance that comes as a result as the body using glucose for the brain and sparing it, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, measure fasted on a morning that you're not actually doing a fast just before you eat and then measure postprandial. Okay. This is important. And there's some research to back it up. There's a study that was published in the journal scientific reports that looked at 12 million people, a lot of people. Okay. And they looked at subjects that had glucose levels between 100 and 199. And they found that for every 18 milligram per deciliter increase in glucose, there was an associated 13% increased risk in all cause mortality higher levels of glucose in 12 million people. This really indicates higher glucose gives you a higher risk of mortality. Okay. Now they found the ideal range between to be between 80 and about 94 in a fasted level. That's your goal. Now, if you fast a lot, you might find that your glucose sits a little higher, but you still watch what happens postprandial. If you don't come right back down after having a meal, you need to either fast more or consider not fasting anymore. Maybe it's not working for you. The other piece, you want to look at ketones being elevated above at least 0.7 millimolar, ideally above one millimolar for a minimum of eight hours. This is the issue I have with 16-8 fasting. Is it's, it works great, but you're getting yourself right to the point where you're increasing ketones. Ketones tend to increase right around 16 hours. So ideally a 24 hour fast puts you at a nice point where ketones are elevated for eight hours, up to 16 to 24, right? So measure your ketones. If you're not allowing yourself to get to that one millimolar, you need to increase your fast or maybe even increase your frequency. The next thing you need to look at is you're losing strength. Okay. Sometimes the mirror can be deceiving. You see yourself every day, but numbers don't lie. If you start losing strength in the gym, you need to wonder what's going on and you need to decrease your fasting. It happened to me. I backed off the fasting. My strength went back up. Number four is your lipid biomarkers should improve. Okay, as long as you're not eating copious amounts of saturated fat and copious amounts of, you know, bad foods, you should see an improvement in your lipid profile. If you're not, you have to ask yourself again, the question is, why am I fasting? Am I fasting because I'm mentally addicted to it or am I fasting for a longevity perspective? If your lipid profile is not improving, you gotta pay attention to that. And lastly, this is a way that you can test things. If you've been fasting and you're fast at just the ideal amount, 
you should be able to go a couple days without carbohydrates and not have any weird symptoms. Plain and simple. Because the keto flu happens because people are transitioning to low carb and their body's not adapted. If you are fasting enough, you should have just enough fat adaption, adaptation so that when you end up going keto for whatever reason, two days, three days as a test, you should have zero symptoms. You shouldn't feel bad. You should be so adjusted to fasting that your body can migrate over to zero carbs without any problem. That is a great sort of anecdotal, experiential, circumstantial test that you can do. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't fast too much. Fast enough for you. I'll see you tomorrow.